Thank you for joining me. Uh, this is our webinar on redesigning your website strategies and considerations. Uh, so just a quick intro to myself. Uh, I am Sean, I'm growth director here at Webbox. Uh, there was a picture of me looking incredibly happy. Uh, oddly, I've got the same shirt on there. That wasn't actually planned. This, that, those photos from a few weeks ago, um, obviously just in the wash cycle. Um, if you want to reach out to me, get in touch, then my email address is there, sean.giles at webbox.co.uk, um, and feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn as well. I'm always happy to make uh, new connections. And just a couple of uh, elements before we begin. So as I said, we're recording today's session. So uh, once that's been processed after, we'll, we'll edit it together uh, and get a copy sent out to you all so you can kind of review it um, as, as and when needed. Uh, I'll also send out a, a copy of all the slides. So if you want to review anything or, or look up anything in the slide deck, you'll have a chance to do that. Uh, and also there'll be a, a section for questions at the end. Feel free to ask questions or pop them in the chat as we go. Um, I can't actually see the chat at the minute, so we'll, we'll um, sort of look at, look at all those at the end in one go. And uh, please join in the conversation. So if you find this uh, content useful, you enjoy it, um, you know, obviously, again, we're, we're uh, more than happy for you to, to share it and, uh, and shout about it on, on socials. We're at Webbox Digital. So let's get going without further ado. So the content that we're covering today, um, obviously it's all focused on redesign your website and what that kind of project looks like, what that process looks like and some good uh, elements and tips to take from that. So I'd just like to, to you know, show an overview of what we're gonna be going through so that you know what to expect today. So we're looking at these 10 key areas within this process. So why you should redesign your website in the first place, um, planning your website redesign. So what does that actually entail? Uh, website audit and assessment, so looking at your current website to help you then create your new website. Defining the scope, obviously a very important uh, uh, task in, in the whole process. Uh, design and UX considerations, so what you should be thinking and looking at and from, a, from a design and user experience perspective. Um, SEO and content strategy, obviously very important. Uh, mobile responsiveness, technical considerations. Uh, user testing and quality insurance, again, a really, uh, really, really important step in the process, and then launch and monitoring. So we'll kick off with obviously number one. So why redesign your website? Now, um, it, again, just good to get a bit of a bit of involvement from the guys on the call. So uh, if you can use the hands up um, uh, element on uh, on Google Meet, uh, it'd be good just to see how many people are actually considering redesigning their website now. Well, this may be something that you're currently going through or doing in the next few months, um, or I can hear a few bings going up, so that's good to hear. Um, obviously, you know, that I would imagine that's why you're here, because um, that's the process you're going through, but it's just interesting to, to know how many of you are actually actively doing it. So first up, so why, you know, why, why, why uh, redesign your, your website in the first place? So these are the four key areas we're going to have a look at here. Um, or Sorry, the first three is the importance in today's digital landscape, um, the sign it's time for a website redesign and benefits uh, of a redesign. I'm not actually going to look at any case studies, but um, so it's the first three elements here. So importance in today's digital landscape. Why is it important uh, that you might you know, need to go down this route and do a redesign of your website? The first thing is competition. Now, uh, as you, you'll be aware, there are thousands of thousands of uh, businesses and organizations just in the UK alone, and there are millions and millions of websites that people kind of access on a data or can access on a day-to-day -day basis. So there's a lot of competition out there from a business perspective, because there may be other businesses that do similar things or the exact same thing as you. Um, you, know, you, might, you might be a business that is in the unique position where that isn't the case. Um, and the, so your customers are going to be, you know, shopping around looking for different organizations or looking for a service or product. Um, and you've got to compete with everybody else who is online, uh, to, to, you know, get that, get that business. Ultimately, everyone's competing for the same customer base. Uh, and the other thing that goes hand in hand with that is the ease of access to information. So if somebody, you know, comes to your website and is looking for your service and they, they find you through, you know, search engine. Uh, if your website isn't performing from a design perspective, you know, maybe it's not designed very well, the user journey isn't very good, or from a technical perspective, it might be slow, it might be a bit clunky, the forms might not work very well, then the user is just going to kind of you know, go away, go back to their search engine and look for 
the service or product again and, and click on another link. So again, you've got that comp competition aspect of it, but because it's so easy now for people to shop around and look for, for different um, elements, then it's really important that you consider uh, a redesign or the, the design of your website um, in today's day and age. Uh, and what are some of the signs, you know, it's time for a website redesign. Those, those of you that put your hand up may already be very well aware of these and the review in your own websites, but it's just important to um, have a look at a few of these as well. So, you know, the first one, really obvious one is the age of the website. So typically uh, a life cycle of a website would be kind of like three to five years, but that again can be depend on how it's built or the platform that's built on as well as how it's been designed, because it might be that the design used for the website has uh, kind of more classic elements that will will stand the test of time a bit more, um, or it could be you know designed very much in a kind of pocket and and goes out of design very quickly. So the age can can vary, but typically you know that sort of three three years is a is a typical um, number for for looking at a redesign. Um, your visitor and conversion rate. So we'll talk a little bit more about data um, later in the in the uh, webinar. But looking at your visitors and your conversion rates, you know, are they kind of flatlining so they're they're not going up or down, or are they crashing and burning basically? So you can look at uh, things like Google Analytics, and again, we'll talk about those tools. But understanding, you know, are, how many visitors you actually get into the website on a on a you know, weekly, monthly basis. And how many of those are actually staying? So you might have a really high uh, kind of visitor count, but they're, they're all bouncing and disappearing very quickly. So uh, looking at all these 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 elements of data to understand, you know, is it time to to refresh the website and, and have a think about how it's uh, operating? Uh, questions or complaints? So again, uh, this could be questions not necessarily around the whole website as a, as a whole, but if you've got content on the website and people are asking you or coming to you, you know, they might be phoning up or emailing you, asking you questions when the content is on the website, that might be a sign that the, the website's not very usable. They can't actually find that content. And we, we speak to people quite often that have that issue. Their website may be, you know, a few years old and it gets bloated with more and more content. So they need to relook at it and see how they can focus that in and make uh, the user experience better. Um, or even as far as complaints, so people might just get really frustrated using your website um, and you know they're, they're sending those complaints in. So it's maybe a sign that something needs to be addressed and uh, looked at. So then, you know, you, we, we know what, what we need to look for to, to consider a redesign. So what are the benefits of redesigning a website? Uh, first and foremost, you know, it's improved user experience. So ultimately, like we're saying, it's very competitive and we want to make sure that people are having a good experience when they come to our website. It's also a reflection of the business. So, you know, you want the website to reflect you, your branding um, and your the kind of overall feel of the business. If, if the website, you know, looks half finished and it's not quite done properly or there's elements that don't quite work and it doesn't really reflect well on on your business and the kind of, uh, you know, what, what you kind of strive for as business. So it's making sure that that reflection is there as well as the user can find content easily. They can get in touch with you easily and they can do all the, the things that they should be able to do um, and interact with uh, on your on your website. Um, better SEO. So, you know, we want to make sure that user experience is good, but we want to also make sure people can find us as well. So having a better design website um, and that's from a technical perspective as well as, you know, that user experience speed, all those kind of things uh, will help improve SEO. So SEO comes down to things like content, but also things like um, speed of the website, the, uh, the mirroring of the content between mobile and desktop. Um, ensuring that uh, you've got like certain keywords in place in in the content, making sure that the metadata is set up correctly, uh, making sure that uh, it's kind of like schema code and markup, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on, but making sure all these things are in place on the website so that you can improve that SEO score and get that organic traffic. Um, and then ultimately increased conversion rate. So again, we're looking at user experience, making the, the website as easy to use as possible. And you know, when you've got happy uh, customers and they, they're impressed with what it is you do and, and that there's no barriers on that website, then um, those conversions are gonna go up. And that's where you know, reviewing that data to understand um, what do we need to change or it, do we need to make changes to increase that is, is very important. 
Uh, and also, you know, it might align with the business goal. So uh, doing a redesign, it can be that maybe, you know, maybe maybe the user experience isn't very good or the design's outdated or whatever it might be. But it could also just be that the business has, has kind of changed their proposition or changed what you're offering. Um, so make sure that the, the design of the website reflects that and is like moving along with the business as well. So step number two, so planning your website redesign. So the things we're going to look at in this section are setting clear objectives and goals, um, an audience analysis, and creating strategy, uh, uh, creating a strategy and timeline. So first up, setting your uh, clear objectives and goals. Um, you know, what are your goals? What are you trying to achieve? And this could be as simple as, um, you know, you write down a, a list of what they might be. Uh, they could be things that don't necessarily have numbers attached to them straight away, but you can very much look at things like sort of industry averages or maybe, you know, the number of visitors you're getting, the number of conversions you're getting and up that by you know, five, 10, 15%. So by uh, doing the doing the redesign, it might be that you want to improve your conversion rate by 10%, 15%. So mark that down and, and set a clear uh, a, a goal or objective through that. The reason that this is beneficial is because if you set that goal, um, you know, everything you're doing is driving towards that. If it's just like, oh, we want a new website because we want it to look fresher and, and you know, look more modern, it doesn't really you don't really know if you're fully achieving the goal or not. You know, it, it, ultimately, this is about uh, putting something in place for your customers and for your business to, to succeed and grow. Um, and again, aligning with the benefits. So those benefits that we just talked about, it's, it's improving the SEO, it's improving the user experience, it's improving the conversion rates. So align those goals and objectives with those um, elements and make sure that um, the things that you kind of plan out are all, all considered within the process and whoever you're um, working with, whether it's internal, whether it's an external agency, you're working with them to, to uh, hit those objectives and make sure that the, the website is successful for you. You know, it's not a process. It's not an exercise of um, getting something new and shiny. It needs to make sure that this is actually working uh, for the business and for your customers as well. Uh, and then conducting an audience analysis. So. Uh, this is one that's, that's quite interesting and it is quite, comes up quite often and, and you know the question is how how do we do this so there are various ways that you can understand your audience um, and you know it, it, I've done a, a presentation before and a, a webinar on uh, how to plan a, a, a your website user journey now we talk a little bit about audience in that and very much at the start of the process, and we find that a lot of businesses will do this, they have their target audience, but it's something that they have uh, you know, thought of themselves or created themselves. So it's what they think of as their target audience. Now, that's a really good first step because it's you know, with your product, with your services, who is it that you're, you're aiming towards? And then you can use data and you can use uh, more analytics as you go to, to kind of refine that because it might not be that that's the, the, the target that you've created is exactly the right person. So it's about then using data to kind of shape that and, and um, uh, put it into the right, right person. So what you can do is use data from your existing website. So if you've got things, and again, we'll talk about these a little bit later, but things like um, Google Analytics and Hotjar, you can use that data to understand, you know, generally the users that are coming to the website, what kind of pages is it they're trying to access, what kind of content are they trying to get to, um, where are they converting and where are they not. With things like Hotjar and Clarity, you can see um, where how they actually interacting with the website, the kind of um, where they're scrolling to, where they're hovering their mouse over, all these kind of things, which we'll dig into a little bit later. Um, so you can build up a bit of a picture around around what they're what they're doing uh, on the website, uh, and then a good another great great way of doing it. So that's kind of more quantitative data in terms of what people are actually doing and you know, numbered data. But we want if we want qualitative data, if you've got things like mailing lists and you send out um, emails to your to your client list. It's a great way of either, you know, you could put a survey in there, you could find your most engaged or maybe even your least engaged um, customers and ask them questions about, you know, what their interests are, what they um, are looking for from your organization and get, again, get a better picture in terms of uh, whether it's age, sex, you know, geographic uh, location, um, what the kind of things they're looking for, their behaviors and habits, and you can build up that bigger, uh, deeper analysis of, of those uh, customers as well. And then also then 
Um, the final one you know, could be physical, it could be um, over, a, over a, a, a video call, but again, workshops with existing customers. So it might be that you offer them um, you know, a discount or a voucher or something to take part in this. But uh, if you can get your customers in a room and get them to you know, discuss uh, elements around your business, around your organization, what they like and what they don't like or what they come to you for, again, it's about building up that understanding of um, who it is you're actually targeting and what it is. Uh, that they're looking for on the on your website uh, and then creating a strategy oh, oh and timeline sorry i've obviously missed that slide there um so creating your strategy and timeline so when you're planning the website uh, redesign you want to make sure that again like setting goals you put in um, an idea of of when you want that to be achieved so you know if if we get tenders through for uh, website projects or we work with someone on a website project um, they'll often have a, a deadline that they either need to meet or that they want the website to launch on. Um, and we can work with that client to um, work back in terms of all the steps that need to need to be taken to you know, achieve that goal. So it, it's all, it's, it, you know, it, it, having the understanding of the process is is going to be difficult i guess from your your perspective of knowing exactly um if if a deadline is is uh, completely realistic or not um but it's about having that open dialogue with whoever you're working with again whether it's internal team or whether it's external to understand how to get there and then the strategy point is um making sure that again you understand the steps needed to to get through so the strategy that we go through um we break it down into steps is that we'll start off with uh, what we'll call the discovery or a kickoff stage where we'll we'll talk with clients and understand their requirements, their goals and objectives, um, the kind of things that we've just talked about now. Look at your current website, look at websites that you do or don't like and things like your branding. Um, and we discuss all that and the functionality of the website up front. Then we move into the design phase um, and you know we'll talk a little bit about design in a minute uh, move into the development phase and then into testing and then launch so the strategy again is is understanding uh, the kind of steps that you need to take to go through this this um, process and uh, and achieve achieve a, a new website at the end of it uh, point three is the website audit and assessment. So this, similar to our kind of discovery stage, um, we, we look at these and we actually offer a free website audit um, as well at Webbox, which I'll uh, tell you a little bit about um, after. So um, audit and assessment, you know, evaluating your current website's performance, conducting content audits, SEO audits, and usability testing, and gathering user feedback and data insights. So these are all really important things to make sure that you do up front. Uh, because again, helping you to understand the kind of goals that you want to achieve or what even is possible um, is, is going to be vital in terms of what the current website is, um, is doing. So first up is evaluate, evaluating your current website's performance. So there are a few things that you can use uh, to do this. And there are obviously like a, a range of different um, areas that you can look at in terms of the performance so uh one here is the, the first one is the google paid speed insights tool so I've just got a screenshot here on the right hand side of the webbox website um, on desktop so um this gives you a breakdown of performance which essentially means you know speed and how quickly things load uh, and you can see across the top there you've got performance accessibility best practices and seo and it will give you a breakdown of things that um, are kind of negatively impacting that so that you can look at how you can improve it. So it might be that you do an analysis on the current website. And again, depending on how old it is or how, how well it performs, um, it will be uh, it will be of interest so that you know, you know, the, the kind of things that you should avoid. So if it's a, a redesign of a website, but you're not necessarily doing a full rebuild, then this is important to understand, you know, which which areas do we need to fix or update so that the performance does go up and that the best practices are in place and the site is built for SEO. If it's a complete rebuild, um, again, your either internal team or agency that you're using should um, be putting all these things in place for from a complete you know build from scratch so that the site is fast, is SEO friendly and uses best practices, all those kind of things. Um, but it's important to know how the current site is, is, uh, is um, running. Then uh, we can look at things like GA4 and hot, hot and Clarity, like I mentioned before. So these are the analytics tools that will tell you um, how many visitors you're getting. So GA4 specifically, how many visitors you're getting to the site, um, the kind of bounce rates on pages, the kind of areas that they're uh, visiting or, or not engaging with, things like conversions. So you can understand 
which forms are being submitted and which aren't. Um, and then Hotjar or Clarity, which are both very similar tools, these will create heat maps for you. So you can see how far people are scrolling down the page or um, where people are clicking on the page and the, the different user journeys that they're taking. So again, you can get an understanding of um, if you've got a user journey, which is say from the home page to a service page, to a contact page, you can understand you know, where, where people are falling off in the process um, and how you know, elements that you can, you can address uh, to improve it. And then from an accessibility perspective, so uh, Site Improve is a, is a tool that we use um, internally as well. And essentially you do get accessibility uh, through the Google PageSpeed Insights, but it's always good to have a, another opinion as well. Um, and this is a, a plugin you can put into Chrome and it will get feedback um, issues and things that you can update uh, to, to make sure that you're covering, covering as much uh, accessibility elements as, as possible on the website as well. So it's really good to get that understanding of what's happening on the current site so that you know, you know how, how you can improve it and what you need to address um, on the new site. Uh, conducting content audits, SEO audits, and usability testing. So uh, these are all, again, very important. And the first thing you want to do is an analysis of the current website content. And we've spoken to lots of people over the years where they have had a website, um, it's, you know becomes a few years old, it gets more and more bloated with content over the years. Um, and a part of the redesign process is they need to look at that content to understand how they can refine it and make it uh, more streamlined for uh, for their users. I think somebody we spoke to last year had over a hundred pages of like core website content. I can't I don't know if core is the right word there, but and then over two thousand blog posts, which was yeah just seems um, bonkers. But uh, like I say, over time that that content just builds up. So analyze the current website's content and see how that can be um, either refined or reduced to make the access of that content as easy as possible and the cons cons consumation of that um, uh, content as easy as possible as well for the user. Um, the, this image actually I found in terms of a uh, kind of like content library idea online. Believe it or not, I thought it was uh, CGI generated. It's actually the Stuttgart Public Library. So look that up afterwards if you want. It's, it doesn't even look like a real place, but it is a real place. Um, yeah, that's just a side, side note there. <laughs> Um, and then an SEO audit. So SEO audit is very important as well in terms of understanding um, from a content perspective, how your content is performing. So, you know, are you using the right keywords? Do you have the right kind of content length? Um, what, what elements do you need to address within the current content? And that, you know, is a good second step after the content audit. So if you've got, you know, 150, 100 pages, if you can narrow that down to, right, these are the core 15 pages that we need on the website or 10 pages, then you can do an SEO audit on those rather than doing it on every, every page to start with um, and understand uh, those different elements. You can do things as well like research um, keywords within your sector uh, using tools like things like SEM Rush, so that you can understand the, the sort of things that people are searching for within your industry, and you can make sure that you put those uh, those words and those terms within your content. Uh, a good tip for that as well is to maybe look for things that um, you know you, you might have terms that are kind of industry specific or terms that you use internally that customers may not know, so they might say it in a slightly different way. So make sure you think outside the box, think about what what the, the end customer is actually going to be searching for um, and make sure you use those keywords within your content as well. And then uh, last but not least is usability testing. So this one is quite often um, mistaken for kind of accessibility testing as well. But what usability testing actually is, is simply um, ensuring that the website or the function or um, the process is is as usable as possible. So, um, you know, you want people that uh, look happy like this. You don't want people that are like getting grumpy and not being able to use it. So it could be as simple as getting to the home page and going to the contact page to fill out a form. You want to make sure that that process is a usable um it is as usable as possible. There's no barriers in place. Um, there's nothing that's jumping in the way and making that difficult. And you know, from an accessibility perspective, you still want to address that. But this is uh, slightly different from a from a usability perspective. It's looking at the kind of user journey and um, making sure there's no barriers in place for the user when they're when they're conducting their their um, you know uh, activity on the website. 
and then gathering user feedback and data insights. So um, there's many ways to collect this information. So, you know, we could talk about it for a long time, um, but we're actually putting together a free template uh, so that you can, um, you know, basically understand the, the user feedback if you want to go through this process. So if that's something you're interested in, please um, let me know. Obviously, I'll be following this up with an email. So just let me know back and I can um, send that template out to you once it's ready. Um, and we've actually got a couple of upcoming webinars which relate to this as well. So in terms of the data insights, we've got um, one webinar which talks about um, kind of understanding website metrics and another one that looks at the tools to gather those metrics specifically. Um, so we'll discuss those in a bit more detail. So if you're interested in in these uh, in a bit in a bit more detail, uh, looking at these in a bit more detail, then then uh, please have a look at those webinars as well. Um, but I think ultimately, you know, it's using those tools that we've discussed previously and um, uh, bringing the, the the data down into a, into again those those kind of goals and objectives and understand what people are um, trying to trying to access through the website. Uh, point four is defining the scope. So we're, here we're going to be looking at deciding what to keep, improve, or remove, um, prioritizing features and functionality, and budgeting and resource allocation. Both um, super really important bits at the at the uh, end there. So deciding what to keep, improve, or remove. Um, the basic first step here is to list out the current functionality. I thought I spoke functionality on there. Uh, the, the current functionality of your current website. So does it? Um, you know what? What pages does it have? Uh, which uh, contact form does it have? Does it link to any third-party APIs? Am I linking to your CRM or am I linked to a postcode lookup section or um, you know, it might use geolocation? All these kind of bits of functionality that can be on the website. You need to list all those out and make sure that you have an understanding of what the current website does. Um, and then you just simply analyze that functionality. So, you know, you could you could be as simple as put this into a Word doc or into an Excel document, make sure you've got that list out. And, you know, if this is something that you've got, again, an internal team or a, um, or an agency, then they can help you with this list so you can understand exactly what everything is and what it does. But look at this functionality and see, is it still required? You know, do, do, we, do we want to keep this functionality? Do we want to remove it? Or do we want to improve either um, currently you've got and they just email out to several email um, email addresses um, when someone gets in touch. But it might be that, oh, we've got that functionality, but we want to improve that so that it does link in with our CRM. So when someone fills out a form, that, that um, lead goes straight into the CRM and we get notified that way rather than having you know a, a step in the middle uh, that you don't need. So look at all that functionality, understand what the website is currently doing and understand what you can keep, improve or remove. And then prioritizing features and functionality. So um, we've we've had a few tenders in recently, actually, that, uh, and, and proposals that, uh, sorry, briefs that have this format, which is does work really well. So you may have come across it before, but it's the Moscow or Moscow, however you say it, um, list for your new website. So um, this is the M, S, C, and W that you're going to be concentrating on. The must haves, the haves, the could, and the um, wants, basically bit functionality and you want what the website has to have what the website should have and what it could have you don't want to have them and it just the kind of laser on the most so if you are or if you're you know just or how long these kind of things or the kind of um, essentially what the priority then you, you've got that down. Again, you can do this simply in a um, in a Word doc or an Excel doc. It's just whatever whatever works for you best. Really, is, is the uh, I think the, the best route to go down with it. And then uh, budgeting and resource allocation. So this is a really really important step. Um, obviously, you know maybe not everybody knows exactly what it is that they uh, that they need to or the resource that they need. But resource allocation is really important in terms of um, Obviously, the team who are going to build it, you need to know, you know, when they can build it, when who who, who do they have available, um, when can they actually get the project done, but also um, the your internal team as well. So, like the if it's the marketing team or whoever is managing and project managing uh, this this uh, redesign, 
they need to make sure that they are um, available for things like feedback. So during the design process, you know, feeding back on designs and um, being available for meetings. And also in the development process, things like testing and things um, like being available for question in, questions or anything that, that pops up during the process. So, um, a way that you can do that is once you kind of, you know, get into the process and you have a, a timeline or a Gantt chart, we often put together Gantt charts for our project. You can see when you know it, it's it's time for for more involved in the project or be less involved uh, depending on the stage that it's at so you can you understand your resource and from your side to make sure that it, it again moves as smoothly as possible um i typed in resource and this is the image came up i don't know what so i thought i'll pop it in uh, and then budgeting so Budgeting is a funny one because, um, you know, we understand that people want to, um, you know, get the most bang for their buck. They want to, they want to uh, have a most cost effective project they can. And we will always ask um, people about budget when they come to us for with a website project or with a, a performance marketing um, project as well. And the reason for that isn't that if you say I've got 50,000 pounds, then we'll quote it at 49,999 pounds. It's to understand um, the kind of scope that you want to um, achieve or go with with the project. So it might be that if you have a, a smaller budget or a, a, say you know, if you had a bigger budget, you could do more things like um, wireframing and prototyping in design, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, you can do things like user workshops. You can do um, site mapping workshop. You can do all these kind of things up front which um, obviously you know, adds, adds to the project, but they can um, ultimately help you get to a, a better end product. If you don't ha quite have the budget for that, you know, we, we can sort of discuss that with you and it might just be that there is no budget there, but um, it's just understanding, it, like I say, what you can, um, the, the kind of the, the website and the, the app achieve from it. Uh, the best way, I guess, from your, from your perspective, listening to this, you might think that doesn't really help, but, the best way that you can um, understand the budget is either through a bit of market research and you might have um, other businesses or organizations that you can talk to about their, their own websites. Um, or once you've got things like your Moscow list and your, you've done the analysis of your current website, or it might be that you work with an agency to do that um, up front, then you can, you can send out a, a proposal then um, or a pitch with um, to, to several people to understand, you know, what, what kind of budgets come back and, and um, give you a, give you a steer on, on what you're uh, kind of looking at. So it's a very important aspect. And I think, you know, an open discussion uh, around it is, is always the, uh, the best way. So step number five is design and UX considerations. So design UX considerations, we'll be looking at the role of user experience in design, um, trends in web design and their impact, and then wireframing and prototyping, as we've just mentioned. So the role of user experience UX in design, um, it ensures that your website works effectively. So uh, UX, so, you know, typically five, 10 years ago, it would have just probably been called design. But um, more and more recently, it's, it's UX design is the is the term that's being used, and that is because um, it's not just design. It's about understanding uh, what users are kind of you know what their aim is, what their what their purpose is on the website, and making that experience and that process as easy as possible for them. So. Um, it, a, lot, a lot of this comes down into there are sort of like UX laws, which some of them talk about. Um, you know the the kind of the way that users are used to using certain websites or certain functionality so you can use those elements in your design to make sure that it's familiar um, and also just the way that things are laid out the things the way that things um, work together that that make it more comfortable more easy for for your users to interact with your website so it's just ensuring that it works effectively and easily um, and it's all about research and best practices so like i say there are a set of laws or ux laws um, that can be implemented to make sure that the, the, the website and the design that you have is, is um, as effective as possible, basically, and, and easy. And I think we'll, we'll get into it in a second, but uh, we'll talk about the trends now. So the trends in web design, their impact, um, you know, part of that is keep, I say, keep up with the competition, but I think also it's about um, going beyond the competition. So like I say, where whatever business or organization you're in, you want to make sure that you've got a website that works for your users and um, you're competing with every other business that has has a website as well. So you want to make sure that 
not only are you keeping up with them in terms of the the experience and the design and how it how it works um, but you want to kind of push on ahead and stand out you know stand out from the crowd you want to make sure that that your user experience is better than anybody else's and that people will come back to you and because you know it's, the user experience maybe isn't as good on on other websites um, and it sets you apart then from from them um, one thing I'll say, and, and this is where the kind of UX and the laws bits come into as well, is that with the trends, it can be very much dependent on the business. So you can look at website design trends and go like, oh, what's the latest thing that's happening? It could be gradients, it could be um, you know, uh, video, it could be um, 3D animations and storytelling, whatever it might be. But it's understanding if that's right for your business. So if you are, um, I don't know, uh, you know, providing um ho homes or or um yeah property or something like that then you don't necessarily want it to be the websites like you know loading in loads of animations or it's spinning around or it's doing all sorts of of crazy like crazy things on the website you want it to be as, as simple and easy as possible for people to search for properties um maybe add them to a, a kind of favorites list be, inquire about them um and get the job done kind of thing if you're more in a creative industry you might be you know it could be a museum it could be an art center it could be something that's a bit more design related um you can push the boundary a bit more then and, and make the uh the experience a bit more um kind of engaging and and interactive so that that people have a slightly different experience but again it's think about the type of business that you are and that the the goals again that the, the user needs to achieve on the website um and that'll help you to to ha how the design works and and interacts with the, the kind of latest trends uh, and then last but not least here is wireframing and prototyping so um this is a really important step in the project and we've got an example um wireframe that we did here uh, last year and it just basically allows the overall structure of the website to be assessed before design starts so this is not a it, this isn't really the design this is kind of like pre-design so the the idea behind this is that you know i want a home page i want a, a text page or an about page i want a, a services page and i want contact pages and blog whatever it might be you then talk about the kind of the kind of content and the types of content you want on those pages and then you can put together this block wireframe structure to go right well this is the kind of how we'll lay the content out this this works uh, better with this in the content flow and you can quickly and easily you know change this around and move it around and and um, work on that you can also look at user journeys on this so if you uh, especially if you prototype these so it might be that you go from the home page through to the service page and then through to the contact page and you can make these kind of more interactive as well so that you can see how that process works um, and again it just gives you that bit of analysis up front so before the full design commences and um like you go from a blank page to a to a kind of you know finished version one design before you start feeding back it's a way of of visualizing it and understanding um you know what you're going to get before it gets all jazzed up by the by the designers um and this is a thing i thought i'd mentioned but not all businesses want to do it and again you know going back to the budget timeline conversation um this obviously does add to the project budget and to the project timeline uh although it can save you time actually ironically in the in the uh, and budget in the process so it's one of those things where if you if you can um afford the budget and the time up front then it, it means that there's going to likely be less kind of changes and, and um, amends through the design development and you know final final stages of the project um so in the long run it can save you money but lots of lots of business and organizations don't actually do this step they more just go into the the, uh, the design step itself which I'm not recommended, but I'm just saying that's, that's generally what happens. Um, then step six, so SEO and content strategy. So the three areas here we're looking at is optimizing content for user intent and SEO, um, content migration, which is obviously a very important step as well, and then seamless, uh, a seamless transition for SEO ranking. So when you're going from your old site to your new site, um, what does that mean? So optimizing content for user intent and SEO. So you want to, again, assess your current content. So a bit like we talked about earlier in terms of if you've got loads of pages, have a look at how you can either refine that into a, a more focused um, set, of, set of content pages. Uh, a good way to do that is through sitemap and content mapping workshop. There's something that we offer here at Webbox as part of, um, uh, well, we could offer it as a service uh, on its own, but we generally do it as part of a, a project um, itself where again we will look at 
the overall site map and the structure of the current website and the content and then work with you to understand you know what, what is the most important uh, what what are the most important sections how we can make the user journey and the link between the pages better um, and it's just that, that process of refining we put it into a site mapping tool so that you can see it visually um, and it always works really well but that's a great great exercise to go down um, again researching keywords for industry so I talked about these a little bit earlier but understanding uh, using tools like SEM rush to understand um, what it is that people are looking for and the, the kind of keywords that are you know either you know hidden ones that people uh, other people haven't cottoned on to yet but um, also you know what you need what you need to get, get, uh, what you need to be using to make sure you're competing in that organic traffic and then code quality and schema markup. So this is really important as well in terms of SEO. So making sure that the website is built well and you use things like schema markup. So schema markup, if you've not come across it before, um, is essentially a, a type of uh, like markup or code that you put into um, the web pages and it can do things like uh, structure the, the search result that comes out in Google. Um, or when Google then crawls the website, it will give context to what that content is. So then Google again can um, can assign it that context, and it helps from a from a search and SEO perspective as well. So ensuring that things like that are in place um, is really important. Uh, content migration. So this is something that's often overlooked or underestimated. So um, content migration can be a kind of a tricky one in terms of if you've got even if you've refined the content down on the current website or your your yeah your, your old or current website and you want to move that across to a new website um there are things that you need to consider like um i guess you know first and foremost is access to that information so it might be that you're staying with the same agency or you've got the same team that are doing the transfer uh, if you're which uh, hopefully then access the information and the data is absolutely fine if you're going from one agency to another uh, for the new website then um, how the current agency or the incumbent gives access to the new agency um, can often um, you know help or hinder the, the that, that process as well and um, it's one of those things that typically you know takes longer than you think um, and there's there's elements to consider around formatting of content as well so where the current website might be built where a, a content page just has like all the text in one area but when it moves across to the new website um that content you know is kind of been redesigned and reshuffled and it now sits in multiple areas so it could be like three or four different blocks whereas previously it was just one so it's thinking about those things so it could be that the content migration is done automatically through a transfer but then you still need to go in and and kind of edit the format of that um, or again, if it's done manually, then it's um, it, that formatting can be done as you go. But these are just things that you need to um, have think about when it's uh, as it's going through. Um, oh, sorry, yeah, I've just missed those slides, but that's what I was just talking about. And then uh, a seamless transition for SEO ranking. So this one is is really important as well because when you go from uh, one site to a new site. Um, there will invariably be a bit of a dip in uh, SEO rankings, but you want to make sure that that is as, as small as possible. So one thing you can do is create a sitemap file for search engines. So what they will do is go in and pick up that sitemap file and it basically tells them the, the structure of the website so that, uh, that things like people at Google can understand you know, the, the relationship between the different pages and what pages are actually on the website. Uh, the other aspect of this is 301 redirects. So what you'll often get as well is if you've obviously um, culled a load of your content pages and they no longer exist, or even if um, the URL of the pages on the website have changed. So it might be that previously it was, you know, ourbusiness.com slash about, but now it's ourbusiness.com slash about us. Um, you want to make sure that you put 301 redirects in place. And all that basically means is that you go, um, if somebody goes to this URL, then redirect them to this URL. So if they go to um, slash about, then it will redirect them automatically to slash about us. So you won't get any of, like we've got a screenshot here, that I just um, created earlier, uh, where you get 404 page not found type thing. You, you, it, will, it will redirect people to the correct uh, pages and it won't negatively, uh, as negatively impact your um, SEO rankings. Number seven, nearly there, is uh, mobile responsiveness. So uh, here we're looking at the importance of mobile-friendly design, um, ensuring consistency across different devices, and 
mobile platforms. So the importance of mobile friendly design. So hopefully this should be like sort of fairly, fairly obvious, although I, you know, on a business level, it may be that you don't get many um, businesses through mobile. I would argue like, look at that, because it might be your business, but it might also be that your website's rubbish on mobile. So it could be uh, different factors, but um, yeah, just keep that in mind. So then 50% um, of all global traffic is on mobile devices. So, you know, that's uh, across the world. It, it's, it's very heavily used. This is set to increase and it's technology, uh, advances in technology and user, ha user habits that are driving this. People are just more likely to, to go to their phone um, to, to access information these days. Uh, and things like, um, you know, internet improvements. You've got Starlink now, which is like the, the Outranet, um, which is the Elon Musk um, uh, company. So uh as as what like high speed high speed internet gets more accessible to more and more people then i'm sure mobile uh usage will go up even more um and then our google overlords as well so one big thing that happened over the last year is that google moved to a mobile first um index platform so what that means is they used to go to your desktop website um to get all to you know look at all the content and understand and give it context and give you seo scores uh what it now does is goes to the mobile website so you want to make sure that the mobile is designed, the mobile site is designed well, but also performs um, at high speed and, you know, is well laid out, all these kind of things. So it's, you know, we want to keep people happy. So um, this is definitely important to consider. Um, and then ensuring consistency across different devices. So your user expectations are a huge factor in this, because if you think, you know, if somebody's access like through the desktop and then they go um, on, a, on their tablet, computer or on a mobile, you want that experience to be as consistent and as as good across the different devices as possible uh if it's if it's rubbish on one device uh, but it's good on the other device ultimately the rubbish experience will prevail there and they'll get frustrated and not want to kind of interact with you so um yeah you need to make sure that 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 uh, consistency happens across uh, devices and again the google factor um so like i mentioned in terms of the the mobile first indexing uh they're very heavily moving towards that mobile first um platform now so it's, it's just making sure that uh you you consider that and cater for that as well um testing on mobile platforms so again this may be not something that you really need to worry about too much internally but it's good to know about because if um you know you're going through the website project you want to be able to look at it on across different devices and and um, see how it's working as well as you know the the team or the agency that are building it um one that you can use oh gosh just appeared outside the door um one that you can use here is just in chrome dev tools so uh if you use chrome as a web browser you can hit f12 on your keyboard um, and it will open up a separate window you can uh, then uh on the top left there's a little icon that you can click and it will basically um put the screen into uh, uh, as it's shown here on the on the right hand side in the screenshot and you can you can change the either device there's a drop down at the top or you can change the width that the website's being viewed in and then um it just allows you to test it through those different different ranges so if you needed to see what it looks like on an ipad we don't have an ipad to, at that width then you can do that um, there's also a tool called browser stack which is a paid tool um, but it essentially allows you to emulate lots of different browser types and mobile browsers within your um, within your own browser so you can test uh, across across different um, devices and then just physical testing so if you you know you can test it on your own phone you can test it on your own computer through different um through different browsers and just check all those different elements as well make sure that they're um working effectively and um, nothing is nothing's going um yeah upside down or, or wrong on the website uh number eight is technical considerations so we're going to be looking at cms here um, hosting and server considerations security and ssl and then integrating third-party tools and services it all sound very heavy, but I've kept it fairly light, so don't worry. So content management system. Um, so I've just chucked in a WordPress uh, logo here because it's one that, that we use heavily and, and lots of lots of people do use um, do use WordPress. It powers something like 45% of the whole of the internet, which is absolutely crazy. Um, but when you're deciding on the CMS you want to use, there's obviously really important things to, to consider, and, and these are all factors that will come into it. So the business requirements, ultimately. So we uh, also do offer a, um, a CMS workshop internally. Now, you know, it, we, we will very much suggest a CMS based on the, the requirements in a, in a, 
a, a brief or a, a tender document, but it's about understanding what is right for the for the business. So it could be that WordPress works fine because it, um, you know, out of the box, it's a good kind of base plate and then we can build on top of that into the, the system that you need. But it might also be that you need a completely bespoke system that, um, you know, because WordPress or um, Craft CMS or Joomla or whatever CMS it might be doesn't do um, or, you know, doesn't have the, the functionality to do what you need. So it's good to explore those different things and it, around what the business requirements are, like things like integrations. Um, the marketing team resource as well. So this is a, a, a really important one because once the website is built and launched, um, your marketing team or the person who runs the website internally, um, if you have that person, then they need to, you need to make sure that they are able to either spend time doing that, but also um, are comfortable with the CMS that it has been chosen. So we do also offer um, as part of the project process CMS training, but um, and in, hopefully most people do, but um, yeah, it's just making sure that they're they're comfortable how to update content, how to add new content, all those kind of things. And that could come in with past experience. Again, there's a lot of people that we speak to where they say, you know, we've used um, X or we've used Y before, so we're we're happy to stay with that or or um, you know or something similar. And then also, I think really important factor is the longevity and the life cycle. So if you um, get CMS in place and it needs you know every couple of years it needs major kind of overhauls as a new version comes out and that's basically the same as rebuilding the whole website from scratch then it's not a particularly you know cost effective or, or effective cms for you to use in the long run so um it's about obviously there's going to be a balance everywhere but things mm -hmm. like wordpress it does update on a on a regular basis and the, but generally the the bigger updates aren't like uh, you need to completely rebuild rebuild your website it's just uh you know it, it continues to work in the in the background type thing um, and then I didn't want to go, you know, in, in massive detail on the rest of these things, but if you want to discuss them in more detail, then feel free to, to reach out to me. But um, this is this is everything else in the CMS section. So the hosting and server considerations, um, things that you need to really consider are the size of the website. So again, from a content perspective, it might be that you've reduced that down, but some, some websites are just massive. Um, so understanding the kind of amount of disk space and server size that you need, and also things like the number of visitors that come to the website. So if you've got X amount coming now, but you know that's going to go up, and it's a, a lot of visitors, you want to make sure you've got enough bandwidth, you've got enough power and juice in the server that it can actually um, you know run the run the website uh, um, well and not you know crash when when there's too many people on the website. Um, security and SSL certificates. So security is really important in terms of the CMS that is chosen as well as um, whoever's implementing the CMS puts in um, things like security measures so that the, the website is as secure as possible. Um, obviously, that also links into the kind of hosting and server as well. You want to make sure that the, the servers are all up to date and um, well, uh, well protected. And then for an SSL certificate, um, it's just really important to put in place um, from a from a security data perspective. So if there's data transfer and for, trans, transferring anywhere, you want to make sure that you've got an SSL that encrypts um, that data for you. And then um, integrating third party tools and services. So again, from a CMS perspective, you want to make sure that if you've got CRMs, if you've got um, the, the ERPs or third party systems that you can link data with, then you want to make sure that the CMS um, or the people that are building the CMS for you have the ability to to do that and put it in place um, so that you're not you know down the road go, oh, can we link in with this? And they go, no, it's not possible. You want to make sure that um, it's it's a CMS that can do that and uh, and evolve with the business. Uh, number nine is user testing and quality assurance. So I'm just con conscious of time here. I hope everyone's all right. Um, so user testing and quality assurance, we'll look at the role of user testing in the redesign, um, testing for functionality, compatibility, and usability, and ensuring a smooth launch with quality assurance. Um, so first up, the role of user testing in, in the redesign process is, is proof of your hard work. So if you get users to come and test your, your new website, your redesign website, um, it will show where things have improved. So if you, you, you know, you've identified certain goals, you've identified certain blockers or issues with the current website, 
you can then review the results of that user testing on the new website and see, you know, oh, look, the user satisfaction levels have gone up um, or the time to get from the homepage to um, submit that inquiry form has gone down by 45 seconds or whatever it might be. Um, but it's, it's about that proof of what, you know, what is working, how it's improving the website over time. It also allows you to make these tweaks pre-launch. So like I say, you can do you can do the wireframes and you can do all these processes throughout. Um, but what's really going to be really useful is um, getting actual user testing on the kind of development website to understand uh, if there are any blockers or anything. Because you can, and I've had this over 15 years of working in this industry, but you can try and think of every kind of facet and element that somebody you know is going to interact with this website or interact with this content. But there's always somebody that will do something that you've never even conceived of or thought of before. So um, it's just good to get that feedback. And, and you know, if you need to make those tweaks, then um, you can do that uh, before launch. Um, and then some testing tools. So we talked about a couple of these before, but you've got the, the Chrome Dev Tools, Browser Stack, and the Physical Testing. Um, and then you've got Google, Google Page Speed Insights and the Site Improve, which is the Chrome plugin. So using all of these, again, you know, you can use them for your kind of SEO analysis and your performance analysis, but also um, from, the, from the testing of the functionality, how things are running, um, how compatible they are with the different devices, and how easy they are to use. Then um, these, these all still come into play here. Um, and ensuring a smooth launch with quality assurance. So a great thing to do here is to have a testing documentation. So um, again, this can be as simple as a CSV document or a Word document or some sort of um, a form of a structured content that you can list out exactly um, what it is that you want to test what the outcome should be and what the outcome was. Um, and you work through that systematically to test all the different aspects of the website and make sure that they are all working. Um, it's always good as well to get multi-person testing. So if somebody has been project managing this and they're also doing the testing, it might just be so deep into this that they can't see the wood for the trees. So get other people, get other external people, whoever it might be to, to test it as well um, and make sure that you can catch as many um, and it, or if if there are any um, kind of issues and errors uh, as you, as you go, and then last but not least is uh, launching and monitoring. So we have liftoff, the website redesign launch checklist, um, a post launch monitoring error tracking, and then we're looking at gathering user feedback and making iterations. So um, I've just put together this kind of quite simple um, launch checklist and it did inspire me to think maybe we, we could put a document together for this. So again, keep your eyes peeled um, over the next few weeks and we'll, we'll put so together something a bit more formal for this. Um, but there are a list of things that you should really check before launching the website. Um, and again, some of these things can be overlooked or you just get excited and you put the, go to try and get the website live and it's not quite ready, but it's, it, all these things are, are super important. So um, first off is make sure the content's in place and formatted correctly. So, you know, that's part of the content migration, understanding that that's all in place. Um, has all your testing been completed? So use that testing documentation. Uh, has it been checked off by, you know, hopefully multiple people, everything is working as it should be. Um, are there any third party integration or APIs set to production mode? Um, that maybe should say test mode, but um, often with these kind of integrations as well, you can set it, you know, set it to test so it doesn't necessarily cost you credits or cost you money to do lookups. Um, so make sure that when you're going live that that is put back into production mode because otherwise it's not going to work when you're um, when you're in live. Then um, are all forms sent into the correct locations? So test all the forms, test them again, because it's something that, uh, again, can be, can be quite easily missed. So make sure that they're all set up and working correctly. Because when you launch, that's ultimately you want people to be filling those out and get it going to the right place. Um, are all your analytics tools set up and tracking correctly? So again, things like Google Analytics, um, making sure that your goals are in place, um, you know, whether that's downloading files or submitting forms or anything like that across the website, make sure that you've got everything in place um, so that it's ready to go when it's launched. Um, and last but not least, one that trips up quite a lot of people is is the hosting environment set up and ready so where you either you know have the the development website on a development uh, development server so no one can actually access it yet when you go to the live server um, is all that set up and ready you know, way ahead of time because you don't want to get to the point where you go right let's launch it and go oh well we haven't actually got that set up um, and the other thing with that is the domain propagation so if you're um, staying on the same server, then it shouldn't really be an issue. But if you're going from one server to another, 
and you need to change things like a records in the domain so that the URL of the website is not pointing at the old server, it's now pointing at the new server. That can take up to 24, 48 hours to propagate, just means obviously like move across. So, um, it, you know, it, like I say, it catches people out. So they'll go, oh, let's go, let's go live on March the 10th. And then you get to March the 10th and you move the domain across and then go, well, well it's not actually going to be live until the 11th or 12th. So um, it's just really something to, to keep in mind um, when, when uh, looking to launch. Then the post-launch uh, monitoring error tracking. So um, this is really important as well to make sure that um, everything is, is running smoothly. So monitoring of multiple different areas. So you can look at things like website uptime, make sure that the performance is there. Look at the performance metrics through things like Google Analytics as well and understand how many users you're getting. Um, and then user satisfaction, you can put surveys and things on the website. Um, you, you, you quite often see this, uh, if a website is having a redesign, they'll go, oh, look, we're trialing out our new design. What do you think? Let's give us some feedback. Um, so a great way to, uh, and a great time to collect feedback from users. Um, and then error tracking. So pre-launch testing will hopefully catch most of the errors, but like I say, there's always somebody that does something, um, does something weird. Um, Major errors should be picked up by by the developers and by the by the team through that testing process, um, and then you can get tools as well. That that uh, oh sorry, what I mean by that is as well, um, if something goes down or if there's a bigger issue, then um, typically developers will get kind of like emailed that so that they, they they're aware of what's happening. Um, and there are tools as well to monitor errors. So the, the, there's different tools that you can install on the site, which will kind of, again, notify people, notify um, developers when, um, when when things happen, if, if, if they do happen. Then gathering the user feedback and making iterations. So this is a really, really key point as well, obviously right at the end. So it's extremely important that you do this because it's not, again, like I said earlier, about getting a shiny new website, happy days, let's all kick back and retire. Um, this is where, again, another another level of the work starts because you wanna do things like send out web, web, uh, website surveys, look at your analytics um, data and run user workshops and keep that process going and keep looking at the data and the feedback you're getting so that you can make iterations to the website because you've got that new website, you've done your research and you, you've um, you know redesigned it and, and launched it, but you also want to understand when people are coming to the website and using it, um, you know, how are they getting on with it? Are there, are there still any issues? Are the user journeys right? How can we tweak those to make them even better? Um, and it's about those, again, 1% in, uh, incrementations to, to constantly make um, the website and the experience better. <laughs> 